and that is uh, Diane Pennington, who is the Senior Lecturer in Information Science and the ILS Course Director at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. She teaches modules in organisation of knowledge, cataloguing and library systems. Her research areas include library linked data, tagging, classifying user engagement on social media. And she's the incoming chair of the Metadata and Discovery Group. And we also have Jane Daniels, who is the bibliographic librarian at Cardiff Metropolitan University. She has worked in technical services in a public library authority and is the librarian for a local and as a librarian for a local government planning department. She started her professional life working in medical libraries after graduating from the College of Librarianship in Wales at Brisbane, and she's the current chair of the Metadata and Discovery Group. Uh, over to you guys. Hi, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us um, this afternoon for this presentation. Um, this is an update really on where we are with um, a joint initiative between the United States, uh, Canada and the UK on a code of ethics for catalogers. Okay, I'm just going to say, um, show this slide now, which just basically outlines what we're going to do. So the first part is a presentation by myself and Diane. Um, we're very lucky to have joining us this afternoon, um, the other members of the Cataloging Ethics Steering Committee from the United States and from Canada. Um, so they will introduce themselves and they'll also be joining us in the breakout rooms later on. Then I'm going to give a short history of the Cataloging Code of Ethics initiative a brief timeline of the activities and then Diane is going to introduce the nine statements of ethical principles. We're going to have a short Q&A session then, but the bulk of the time really is going to be taken up, we hope, with you joining us in the breakout group discussions. Oh, wrong way. There we go, that's better. So now what I'm going to do is ask um, Beth, Karen, May and Sarah to introduce themselves to you. Hello everyone. Good afternoon for you. Good morning for me. Um, I'm Beth Shoemaker. I'm the Special Collections Librarian and Cataloger at Emory University in Rose Library. Um, and uh, I was part of the original um, American uh, sort of effort with um, within ALA, the American Library Association, to um, to kind of begin to think about um, a, a cataloging ethics um, document and what that might mean for our community. Happy to be here. Good morning. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, I'm Karen Snow. I am the co-chair of the Cataloging Ethics Steering Committee with Beth Shoemaker. I'm at Dominican University's School of uh, Information Studies and that's in Chicago in the United States. And I am an associate professor and PhD program director there. And I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you. Hi, good morning I'm from Toronto, Canada. My name is May Chan, and I'm one of the um, steering committee members here to represent Canadian interests. So more specifically, um, I am a liaise to the Cataloging and Metadata Standards uh, Committee, which is a committee of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations. And uh, my regular job um, is <clears throat> the head of uh, metadata services at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, previously to this, I'm actually quite new to academic libraries. Um, previous to this job, I was in uh, public libraries for, for 17 years. And I'm very happy to uh, serve, serve on this committee and, uh, and, and, and share with you um, our, our, our updates. 
I think that leaves me. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a, a cataloging librarian at Joliet Public Library uh, in Chicagoland. So I'm uh, really excited to be here with all of you. Good morning from me, afternoon to all of you. And uh, let's get started. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just um, give you some background and context to the, the group and the initiative. So, um, at ALA Annual in 2017, the Cataloging and Metadata Management section, which is MDG sister group in the United States, um, held a forum, uh, Power That Is Moral, Cataloging and Ethics. And this was um, devised and offered by Hope Olson and Beth. Now that event proved beyond a doubt that there was definitely a need for further investigation and um, work on the whole issue of ethics and cataloging. And so at ALA Midwinter in 2018, there was another CAMS forum. Now I might stumble over this one, Cooperatively Conscientious Cataloging. I was practicing that earlier and I could not get it out in one sentence. <laughs> but as you can see from the description on the scene, uh, screen, what it did was it provided a venue for people to share their ideas and concerns about um, the process that had already been decided was going to happen, which was the development of a code of ethics for the cataloging community. Then in April 2018, um, ALCTS and CAMS met about forming a task force or working group to have a crack at this task of creating a cataloging code of ethics. Now, Previous to this, actually in January 2018, um, I was a member of the SIG committee and so I had asked committee, would it be okay if I made an approach to CAMS to see if there would be the possibility of a joint initiative between the UK and the USA? And committee endorsed that, so I went ahead and did it um, and passed that through to CAMS, the request, and they were very much in favour of it. So this is why you can see those in attendance at the April event expressed a desire for this to be an international effort. So that was great. We were, we were set up, we were ready to go really. And at the same time, it was considered, okay, well, um, if the UK are being involved, we should really extend um, or reach out to our, our colleagues in Canada. And that's why we've now got um, the steering committee consisting of people from the UK, the USA and the UK and Canada. So in February 2019, we had the first meeting of the Ethics Steering Committee, um, as you can see there. Now at that point, I think um, Diane was already on board, which was great. So we had two UK representatives. So the next thing was that in April 2019, we put out a call for volunteers to participate in some working groups. Obviously, the whole theme and uh, subject of ethics and cataloging is very, very broad and very wide and very deep. And there was no way that the six of us were going to be able to encompass all of that. And the whole point really was to make this a very inclusive process. We needed to be able to tap into people's experience of coming up against ethical dilemmas. And we really needed to know what were those dilemmas and how had people um, coped with them and resolved them. So you can see that we've got six themed working groups and they would concentrate on one cataloging area. They'd have an elected chair, a member of the steering group would serve as a liaison between them and the uh, working group. And we were fantastically surprised to have over a hundred people volunteer to be part of these working groups, which was incredible. So as you can see, really, why have the working groups? Well, as, as I explained, we really needed to tap into your collective wisdom to be able to produce something that was relevant to your needs and um, reflected our common values. So the working groups consisted of um, the themed groups, authority work, classification, and subject headings controlled vocabularies. And then access scope and infrastructure, staffing working conditions, and resource discovery and accessibility. 
I'm going to whiz through these a bit because we were a little bit st late starting, so I don't want to cut off Diane's part of the presentation. <laughs> so in July 2019, um, the working group memberships were finalised. And here is where we had a really, a really another pleasant surprise because although initially we put out our calls on our Canadian, um, American and UK emailing lists, um, we had tremendous support actually from a proper international community. So we have, um, we had people from Israel and also Australia on the working groups, which was brilliant, exactly what we wanted. Metadata knows no boundaries and the issues that we have in creating, sharing, maintaining and enriching it certainly don't have boundaries. So we knew that there was um, going to be areas of common concern that we could all work together to resolve. So between August and December 2019, they work, the working groups worked on their assigned areas of focus and they produced a report for the steering committee. Um, so this was really going to make up, help us to create the document. So the initial goal was to have the draft code of ethics for catalogers available on a, a Google Doc for public comment by April 2020. But um, obviously we had to contend with uh, external issues such as COVID-19. So what have we been doing um, in the pandemic era? Well, between January and June, um, we've been reviewing the working group reports and we did actually produce the first draft of the code. So in June 2020, this was presented at an ALCTS virtual interest group meeting. Um, and at that meeting, we had 38 comments um, just in the chat. Um, we then went on to, to publicly um, open it for comment. So if you're MDG members, you would have seen that we put it on social media, we put it on our blog, we put it in our monthly e-bulletin, we put it on the mailing list, we put it everywhere that we thought people would be likely to look. And as a result of that, between us all, we got 68 um, more uh, comments during the consultation period. So we've been meeting every fortnight and um, we've discussed all of the feedback and what you see today is the product of the re revision that took place. So today then we have the um, presentation of the second draft document. Um, and in that period also, um, because in Canada, obviously you have an Anglophone and a Francophone community, the document has been um, translated for the benefit of the Francophone community and to be able to provide comments. So the next step, steps, as far as we're concerned, is to continue revising the statements. Um, we've got most, through most of the comments. We hope that you will provide more today um, for us to incorporate into the um, producing a final version. And we also want to um, produce some case studies. The document was always intended to be very practical in nature. Um, and we anticipate that the case studies of how people have met ethical dilemmas in their work and how they've dealt with them would be of great benefit to the community generally. And now I'm going to hand over to Diane. Diane, unmute. Okay, thank you. I just had to make sure that I have now remote access to Jane's computer, so we didn't have to switch screens, but unmuting also helps. Um, I also wanted to say as well that I have two dogs who cannot unmute, unfortunately, so if they start barking, they should probably talk because they know more about metadata and cataloging than I do. Um, for the structure of the code here, this is was sort of into three parts and we've got links that we've just put into the chat to see the document as we have it so far. The introduction is just sort of uh, basic information about um, where this came from, um, some definitions, things like that, uh, which I'm not going to go through with you in this presentation, but you can certainly look at it on the draft and uh, then also uh, go through the statements, which I will go over. The case studies will be sort of the final part that we will add at the end. 
we don't have these ready to show yet because they're not really in any sort of particular place to be shown. But what we're hoping, and we'll cover this again at the end, is that we would like to hear from you on things that you've, you've encountered ethical issues in your own work to see if that can help us inform writing some of these case studies. So this is just the, the beginning where we said these will be ethical statements that we will use to guide and improve our cataloging practice. And then we just go through and list the nine uh, statements. So the first one is, and I will try to interpret these a bit. I don't know if I can speak for everyone or, or even the entire committee in terms of my interpretation of them, but it does seem like uh, th these are kind of where we've got to at this point. And maybe there might be more wording that we're still working with that's more appropriate, but this is where we are. And I, we've highlighted in red the, the, the basically the main point of each of these so that we can sort of get to the, the real purpose of each one. So the first one is, of course, facilitating and access and promoting discovery, which is really at the core of what we all do in some form or another, but especially keeping the end user in mind as we do our work. Uh, uh, we have to acknowledge or bring our bias into work, and we can't really avoid that when we're doing our work because we all have them. Uh, but we have to work hard as much as we can to overcome uh, whatever those limitations are that, that are introduced into those bias to make sure that we are still uh, keeping our users in mind, the creators that uh, have contributed to the works and the resources that are, are from the creators themselves. So uh, we have to be aware that those do exist. Uh, interoperability and consistent application of standards. This goes back into even a lot of the morning session, we talk about metadata quality and how uh, mark records can't be really shared and interoperable uh, unless we are following these standards correctly. And we talked about this quite a bit, although we do have to realize that the, the standards are biased and the, what we are working with is biased. And that even came up some this morning in discussion of, of, of course, Library of Contracts subject headings, uh, changing the subject, illegal aliens, those, those issues. Uh, but we do have to think about these carefully and critically to make what the tools that we do have available to us as inclusive as possible while keeping them interoperable and consistent as much as we possibly can. Uh, these standards and tools need to be accessible both intellectually, financially, and technologically. Uh, so there are certain constraints that we all deal with in terms of uh, keeping up with the latest standards, making sure that we can afford access to uh, using the tools that we need to pay for in terms of subscriptions and, and whatever else we need to pay for to do this work, and that we need the technical support and access to be able to use them. And that also these standards are not only accessible, but that we use input from stakeholders as well as evidence-based research to also support uh, making these standards as accessible as possible in these ways. Uh, we will take responsibility for our decisions. So this is really saying that, we, you know, as we, we all know that there is discretion that we have to make our own choices in cataloging individually, uh, no matter how, what kind of standards or policies we have, there are still decisions that we make on our own if we're, if we're using our own catalogers' judgments. Uh, but while we take responsibility of those, we also need to make sure that uh, what we do and the standards that we use and the policies that we create are transparent and that people understand where these decisions are coming from and how they're being applied. And that's part of our professional and ethical responsibility as catalogers. Number six is about collaboration. And we've seen that this morning uh, in the this discussions about acquisitions and vendors and shelf ready metadata, these kinds of things. It's not only that, but just uh, anyone who uses metadata in different places, whoever provides it, whoever works with it, whoever's enriching it, uh, and who creates it and who ultimately uses it. All these different, there's a lot of different people that have to do with the use and creation of, of the metadata, not just us as catalogers, but as everyone who is involved. And so we have to collaborate to make sure that these are meeting the needs of everyone as much as possible. Issues of diversity and quality in the workplace. Uh, this is all about uh, work environment. So making sure that we're getting equitable pay, that we are seen as the professionals that we are, that we get a appropriate education and training uh, not only in the schools, which is where I work, obviously, um, used to be a catalog and I'm an academic, but uh, making sure that those we get additional training in the schools, but as well as that we have access to ongoing training 
as we all know, our field changes constantly. And so we need to make sure that we are represented uh, from a diverse and equal perspective in terms of our working conditions, but also to make sure that we can support search and discovery uh, in diverse and equal situations as well. And number eight, the value of cataloging work. So again, uh, within our organizations and with external partners, that there is a value to all of this uh, that is not just uh, not just a monetary value, but also the intellectual value and what we do uh, add to the value of the, the not only the materials that we provide, but also that that is demonstrated and understood by our external partners as well as, as with our own organizations, whether that's a library, a university or, or anywhere else where we might work. And finally, working with user communities to understand what they need and make sure that uh, the services are relevant and timely. Um, this is just making sure that what we're doing is useful to them, that they're aware of what we're doing, that it's up to date in the sense of we're, we're doing things that make sense in the current context in terms of making things available in different ways, depending on what those user communities are. But we work with them to understand what that is and then implement uh, our services and metadata adequately based on those needs. So these links are available in the chat. Uh, you can see the draft code of ethics or the current draft, which is the second draft basically that we that Jane mentioned after the ALA session is available if you want to see all of the principles again yourself, as well as the introductory material. And there's a link also there as well to just the, the steering committee website, just if you want to see more detail about the working groups and what we've done so far in the committee and so on, which is just a, a general website. So from there, what we'd like you to do uh, is to help us with this as well. And, and we really need your input. So again, involving our communities and we're all one community as well. So we want to, uh, for the, the rest of the time here, we have uh, up until 2.30 officially for sort of the formal part of the question and answer here in this setting. But then we have another, uh, actually from 2.30 to 3.10 is what the schedule says for the breakout sessions that we've been doing already so far to have smaller group discussions. And as we said in the beginning, we will have members of the, the committee throughout those breakout rooms to have discussion and, and um, kind of see your ideas and answer what questions you might have as well. And with the case studies, as I've said, is there any situation where something like these statements that we have would have been useful to you or when it would have you know, maybe guided your decisions or when you faced a difficult situation that you really could have used some advice with, if you can maybe share those, if you don't want to share them in the, in the public chat or in, in discussion, you can also, also just email to either Jane or myself individually. And we will, if we choose to use that, any part of that, we will not make, we'll make sure that you are not identified in any way in, if it is included as a particular case study. And so with that, that's the end of our slide presentation. Um, we're happy to take questions if anyone has any at this point. Oh, thank you very much for that, Jane and uh, Diane. That's extremely interesting. Uh, we haven't got any questions in the chat yet. Um, oh. No, we just have one now. So it says, uh, given that you acknowledge the need for diversity in these decisions, what efforts have you made to ensure diversity in these working on the ethics code beyond nationality? That's from Isidore. <laughs> So could you repeat that one more time, please? Sorry. Sorry, it says, sorry, yeah. Um, it says, given that you acknowledge the need for diversity in these decisions, what efforts have you made to ensure diversity in these working, oh, sorry, those working on the ethics code beyond nationality? That's a discussion that we've had, I would say, pretty extensively in a couple of our meetings. 
Um, and that might be something that uh, the co-chairs, if, if Jane or Beth have anything to say about that. Um, I know you've led some of those discussions as well, and uh, May as well, because Canada Canada's, is, is quite a diverse country. Um, it, uh, if you're not aware of how Canada works, there's a, the Francophone community, as we mentioned, that has um, the d a very different view of things. And I can say this as I'm part Canadian, I lived in Canada for several years, uh, that there are a lot of differences within Canada, but I think that generally speaking, and there are other committee members may have something to say about this as well, that um, in general, a lot of the principles and standards that we work with in our daily work are, are, are have a Western bias already, not just based on nationality, but based on the culture and the language that we bring with that, right? Um, I have a student who just finished a dissertation on including um, CJK materials and catalogs and how do we do that? And there was a presentation on that earlier in the conference. Uh, so there are a lot of issues, not just nationality, but uh, language, different ways of learning. Um, I was the liaison to the access and dis resource discovery and accessibility group, which I tried not to call RDA because I didn't want to think about it, um, but that there were issues around um, what does accessibility mean that my working group was asking that and when i first thought about it i thought about just being able to access materials in ways that were useful to our users but that there's also uh that that sort of um you know different kinds of physical disability issues that might make it more difficult for people to access certain things which uh, some of us have to do based on our local authorities uh, so there are a lot of different issues in that and that's certainly something that we got some feedback on from some of the contributors uh, on the first draft, as well as um, what we were talking about in our meetings is how do we, how are we going to be inclusive of, all of these different things? And it's certainly something we would welcome feedback on. Okay, I think um, May would like to um, okay. say a few words as well. Hi, uh, that's uh, the question asked around nationality is a, is a great one. Um, I think the, I was asked to um, serve on this committee um, partly because of uh, some of the work that I've been involved with um, through my workplace around um, the need to revise our subject headings uh, that refer to um, uh, Indigenous peoples. So in, in the Canadian context, the, the social and political context, there's a, we have, we have a, um, <clears throat> a, a federally mandated um, direction um, around truth and reconciliation. And so this, uh, the, the effort to look, investigate um, how we can um, uh, update our subject headings so we're not using Indians of North America to refer to indigenous, indigenous, indigenous peoples that's uh, part of why um, I think Canada was was involved. Um, there's lots of ethical in, um, implications there. So it's not so much like that's, that's Canadian in scope because of the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. Um, but it's not like Canada, but what, is, what does being Canadian mean here? Um, I mean, I think another thing about what characterizes um, um, Canada, I mean, it's, it's we've got, um, what is it, 10 provinces, three territories. Um, and, you know, there's, um, um, you know, in the urban centers, it's, it's very multicultural, uh, multilingual. So one of the things that I, I, I have been trying to bring um, into the group, but, but then this is where we, um, um, in a way, when we tapped, when we did a call for uh, volunteers for the working groups, that, that also reinforced um, this, th these characteristics of what, um, what, Canadian libraries are, 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 are working with. Um, but, you know, I have a, also a particular interest, as, as many catalogers do in Canada, in figuring out how to represent um, materials in other languages in, Eng in English um, more, more fully and not so much with a Western bias. You know, there's a lot of um, um, standards around transliteration and romanization. And, you know, those, uh, for example, just, just those are just like not ways that people who use, um, like say Persian, Arabic, Korean, Japanese, Chinese materials will look for materials. So, so that would be an example of where it's sort of trans, um, like, uh, like it's not national per se, but uh, uh, it is like a, a characteristic of, of Canadian um, um, of, of libraries. And that would, I would imagine that would also be a shared one in the UK and, and the US. 
Um, but yeah, we, we have um, other working group members that represent those interests um, in, in different ways. And then um, I think another thing around another axis, if you like, or, or, or spectrum is sort of like the type of library uh, we've considered um, not just um, um, like we, we acknowledge maybe that our group was a bit academic heavy. We have Sarah um, from public libraries. I have a background in public libraries. Uh, we did a consult with um, with school libraries as well for for specific input. So those are some efforts. I'm sure we have left out many others, but this is one of the reasons why we're presenting to you to um, ask that question aloud and also invite others to uh, remember the other people um, or groups that maybe we have naturally or just just by nature of being limited for, for, forgotten. Great, thanks, me. I think Karen would like to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Jane. Um, I just kind of wanted to add to my colleagues' comments, which have been fantastic and trying to kind of frame uh, the way that we've approached this work. Um, you're absolutely correct. We're a fairly homogenous group as the steering committee. Um, and so that was why we were very intentional about um, creating our working groups, that there, it was diverse as possible. Now, um, we did ask specific questions, like about asking you know, about the different uh, characteristics and that. So we were hoping just by spreading, you know, the word far and wide for volunteers, we posted on uh, various, obviously cataloging a uh, discussion list, but so we also posted, um, you know, within like the school library community, uh, community um, and elsewhere, right? We tried to be very intentional about making sure that we uh, got as much um, diverse representation from the cataloging community as possible from a variety of different uh, characteristics. So, um, and that's why we continue uh, to have these forums to try to, you know, get feedback from a, var a variety of different shareholders. Um, and, and so that's, I guess, our answer to that, that it's, it, like I said, it's not a completely diverse uh, steering committee, but we're trying our best to include as many diverse voices as possible. Thank you, Karen. Right, so we're running a little bit <laughs> over, but uh, there are a couple of other questions. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, could I just quickly ask these brief questions? Um, yes. One of them is from uh, Alan Danskin. Are, uh, are there any plans to develop good practice or implementation guidelines? Um, well, I think the document itself is a starting point in this whole exercise. Um, if you look at it, you'll see that it's it's quite concise. We've given quite um, pithy, quite concise ethical statements. Um, and for me, um, the main part of it really, or the, the bit that's of most interest to me um, is the case studies, because I think that will give us a give us a way into producing something maybe a bit more um, meaty in terms of guidelines for implementation. But we had to have somewhere to start, I think was the way we felt about it. And it's such a huge topic. Um, we just wanted to have a starting point. Um, I think probably as well, uh, what will come out of it is we will produce a uh, a final document. I don't think ever it will ever be a final document actually. I think what we produce later this autumn will be the first final document but then we're very aware that we will need to build on that and the next and that the people who come after us to review it and we have to decide how often that happens um, they will be in a position to amend not only this document but also maybe um, and, you know, produce something along the lines that Alan's talking about. But we are very much, I think, at the beginning of this whole journey. Uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, another one is, are there any plans to share the reports created by the working groups on their various areas of interest anywhere? This did come up actually. Um, I'm going to be. I'm going to exercise bias here. Okay, I make no bones about this. I was the liaison for the authority working group. I knew nothing about it at all, um, and I felt a real fish out of water. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to understand this. I've never created a name authority in my life. But the report that they produced was really excellent. It was clear. It was concise. 
um, it gave lots of examples um, and it was suggested that that particular report might be reproduced in some format as part of um, as something that people train in for NACO work could refer to. Um, I think as a committee we have yet to sit down and sort of um, decide what the policy will be regarding the reports that the working groups produced. They were told quite clearly I think at the beginning that there was no plan to um, publish them um, but you know I, I think we have to convene again and think about what we want to do about the reports obviously with the permission of the people that um, whose intellectual content went into them. Okay, I'll just add that. Oh, okay. Seth, we've got we've got really bad bad feedback on your oh. mic. <laughs> okay. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> And then a final question from Natasha, which says that uh, statement four says that we support efforts to make standards and tools financially accessible to all catalogers. Doesn't this contradict the subscription model of RDA and how will that be made available to all catalogers given the number of libraries who do not have a subscription to RDA or uh, any room in their budget for it? That's a very good point. Um, I as chair of MDG, I have started conversations with the publishers of the RDA um, toolkit with very much that line of reasoning that if we want it to be a truly international and accessible standard, then we really do need to review the subscription model under which it's published. Um, so I've got, no, I've got no news on that, I'm afraid, but I have raised this because it does seem to go quite contrary to the whole philosophy of the toolkit. So I think we, we as a community of practice really need to get put our heads together and think about how can we make it accessible, you know? Um, but I, as to how practically we do that, um, as I say, we've started a discussion, but we need the community to um, think about how we might be able to do that and come up with alternative models for access, accessibility. Yeah, and I, I will say just from uh, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say just from a, an academic point of view, uh, teaching with the RDA toolkit is quite expensive for schools as well. And this is something that I've had to even you know fight with quite a bit with um, my even you know within my university uh, to them it, it, they don't understand why I have to pay for this when everything else that I pretty much use is mostly cloud-based or free. I use Koha for teaching and other things are available. And when I think back to when I first started teaching cataloging, when we just rolled in uh, copies of ACR2 on a cart and we rolled in everything else in a cart and it was all available uh, right there in print for all the students to use. And that has been a major transition. And then when I have students who go out into work and they say, well, it's great that I've learned RDA, but I can't use it because my library can't afford a subscription to a toolkit. So I, I think, you know, Jane's trying to make some, some, do some work into this area, but I think it's something that we all need to try to work on together. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow with the new version. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's conversation to see if there's going to be any change in the subscription pricing models, but you know, we're still waiting on, on all of that, I guess, as well.